Hello and welcome to A-Level Sociology at Hearts and Essex High School. This is your e-induction information and taster lesson 2020. So let's meet the sociology department team and let's have a quick look around your classroom. Hello from me, my name is Mrs Jukes, I'm subject leader for sociology. And this is Mr Gibbs. He's also a teacher of sociology. I will be teaching the majority of your lessons from September and Mr Gibbs may be teaching you just a few hours of sociology next year. As you can see, he is also the subject leader for psychology. So if you choose to do both sociology and psychology, which work really well together, uh, then you'll be seeing Mr Gibbs a fair amount next year. We also have a designated sociology classroom in room nine. Um, so let's have a quick look at that room now. And also there's a quick hello from me. Okay, so I thought I'd take you for a tour around room nine, which is our dedicated sociology classroom. So here we go. This is room nine. Can see up towards the back of the classroom we've got some of our key sociological thinkers and um, they help us as you have to learn lots of names throughout the course and you can also see some of the key sociological concepts dotted around so this is room nine like I say our dedicated classroom and if you can visualize yourselves you'll be sitting here in September Hello prospective Year 12 Sociology students, my name is Mrs Jukes, I'm Subject Leader for Sociology and I look forward to seeing you in September. So what is sociology? For many of you, A-level sociology will be the first time you've encountered this subject. Some of you may have done it at GCSE, but for lots of you it may be completely new. And the big question that always faces me is what is it? So in its very essence, Sociology is the study of society. What we're interested in as sociologists is studying human social life and trying to explain the social world that we find ourselves in. We're very interested in the way that how society is structured, how society influences us and shapes our lives. We're particularly interested in the patterns of behaviour we see in society and we try to offer explanations for those behaviours. For example, a pattern of behaviour that we might see in society um, in the topic of crime and deviance is most criminals seem to be male. So sociologists would look at that pattern and try to offer different explanations as to why that may be the case. In order to develop these explanations, sociologists look at different social institutions that exist in society such as the education system, the unit of the family and the criminal justice system. We try to explain what their roles are and again, how these different institutions affect our behaviour. So let's listen now to some of our ex-sociology students and hear what they have to say about sociology at Hearts and Essex. Hi, I'm Jada and I study psychology at UEA. I chose to take sociology A-level because I thought it was a super interesting subject and it had so many real world applications that I felt like it was worthwhile learning for the long term. And I was right because I still rely on it a lot now at uni and even just- Hi, my name's Freya and I'm currently studying sociology at uni in Liverpool. I wanted to study um, sociology A-level because at the time I wasn't sure um, what career I wanted to go into and I knew that studying it would let me explore a range of topics and find out what. Hi I'm Lucy I study sociology at Warwick University I do that alongside psychology modules as well I took sociology A level at Hearts and Essex along with history and psychology I chose to take sociology A level at Hearts and Essex because I'd done it at GCSE and I really really enjoyed Sociology more than other subjects you can link to the world in which you live like if you compare it to more science and maths based subjects 
it's harder to kind of link it and make it relevant to your life um so for that it was really good um for me sociology was a subject i've really really enjoyed studying at gcse um, and i genuinely looked forward to attending the lessons so for me it was kind of a no-brainer that i was going to take it at a level um in terms of other a levels it works really well with psychology as well so if um, people were looking to take another subject sociology and psychology go really well together a lot of the uh, topics you do overlap so especially research methods so it, that helps you to get a really kind of deeper and broader understanding um, it's almost acts as a sort of revision if you go to a psychology class and you've already learned it in sociology hi my name's izzy and i study sociology at warwick university i've studied it from gcse to a level and now for my degree and i absolutely love it studying the subject a level really opened my eyes to the world around me and it showed me how society works both in the ways that individuals work together to improve institutions and in both the positive and ne negative aspects of institutions so such as with the inequalities established in the criminal justice system which have led to disproportionate numbers of ethnic minorities being arrested which is obviously still so relevant today A-levels provided me with baseline knowledge like this, which also meant I felt really prepared when I started my sociology degree. Sociology at university is also so interesting, and it has extended my knowledge even further about the world around me, while also widening my horizons in terms of the different types of careers that I can go into, which aided by having a sociology degree. I've studied a range of important topics at university, from gender and sexuality to the history of colonial racism and how it impacts inequalities today. And I believe that topics like this are vital for people to learn about since inequalities influence so many aspects of our lives. I wouldn't know half of it as much about modern society without studying sociology, and I believe that studying it at both A-level and for my degree has been instrumental in developing, developing me as a person, and it would do the same for anyone considering studying it. as an adult in general. I chose to stay at Hearts and Essex because I already had great relationships with my friends and the staff there. Sociology was probably the most important subject for me to take and a lot of the other six forms didn't offer it as an option. So that as well as the fact that the sociology staff at Hearts and Essex are just the absolute best, it was pretty much a no-brainer. That I stayed at Hearts and Essex because of the friendly learning environment. I knew that I'd be confident um, to share my own opinions in lessons and that the teachers are really friendly and approachable so they'd be able to help me with any issues I was. I stayed at Hearts and Essex to do sociology at A level because I had really great relationships with the teachers and I knew how fantastic the teaching was so for me there was no choice other than to stay. Um, sociology and the whole school get really good a level results and that's a credit to how good the t teaching is especially in sociology so that was probably the main reason i stayed on i basically enjoyed every single topic my favorite was crime and deviance because i found the theories the most interesting and after every lesson i just wanted to know more Sociology as a whole though was beneficial to me in so many ways. It really set me up to do well at uni with my knowledge of theory and research methods. And there's a lot of overlap between social psychology and sociology. More than just knowledge and content wise, sociology A-level definitely refined my skills, especially in communication. Learning all that I did made me so much more eloquent and socially aware so that I was able to have intelligent conversation especially with new people and lecturers so that came really useful for job interviews. I also think that it developed my critical thinking skills massively so now I'm able to evaluate and question things rather than just taking information at face value which is a really useful skill. My favourite thing about the course was that um, there's a lot of space to share your own um, opinions and experiences and that helps you to gain an understanding of other people's perspectives. Um, it gave me a great foundation for my degree because it helped me understand the importance of being an independent learner and that um, doing work outside of lessons is important but it can also be fun because you have the freedom to research topics that you're passionate about yourself. Um, it also taught me to be a critical thinker. I loved the whole of the sociology course, but if I was to pick one topic, it would probably be 
education I think it's really interesting that you can study something that you're literally directly experiencing at the same time if I was to give advice for doing sociology A level I would say watch the news that's a really really big one that Miss Jukes talks about if you want to kind of do that extra thing and make your essays extra special you need to put your own work in it needs to be fresh and new and have kind of new sociological ideas you can't just rely on what you're given Me Sarah and I study sociology, media and business. I decided to study sociology as I want to look at the real issues affecting society today and how they differ from the past. I also enjoy looking at the different sociological perspectives and gaining me a deeper understanding of how society works. I moved from Hogwarts Hutt to Essex mainly for sociology as it's something I definitely want to do at university, therefore I wanted to gain a deeper understanding of the subject. I definitely enjoy all of Mrs. Duke's lessons, as you're always doing something different, whether it's copying notes from a PowerPoint, watching a video, or even doing a bit of role play. She really tailors her lessons to fit everyone's needs and makes sure everyone fully understands the content before moving on. Any advice I'd give you if you're deciding to choose sociology is make sure that you have a real interest in the subjects, as A-levels are such a big leap from GCSE, you don't want to be stuck with a subject you don't enjoy. And with sociology, I definitely think it's something that really opens your eyes and ha gives you a whole new outlook on society as a whole. Hi, I'm Mason and I study sociology here at Hutton Essex. I was a transfer student from Burnt Mill, obviously, didn't go here for secondary. But um, the reason I transferred here is because I felt a really welcoming atmosphere when I first started. And it was really easy to transition from like secondary school to sixth form. And if you're thinking about choosing sociology, I really recommend it. Because you get to learn so much about the patterns in society and why things are the way they are and how we can change those issues. So, why should you do A-level sociology? Well, sociology, unlike lots of other subjects, is ever-changing. Um, every time the government changes a law, um, it affects what we learn in sociology. The textbook essentially can go out of date very quickly as the world is constantly changing around us. The other thing that's great about A-level sociology is you can bring your own life events and ideas into the classroom in a way that you might not be able to do with other subjects. For example, in year 12, we look at um, the ideas surrounding family and education, both of which you are involved in in some way. So you all come to the classroom with your own unique experience of what family might mean to you. And you also come to the classroom with your own unique experiences of the education system. And we can use these to help develop your knowledge in those areas. The other great thing about sociology is it asks you to challenge the views that you have about the world and discuss them. There's lots of discussion in our sociology lessons. Uh, you may find yourself debating with other people, um, but that's great because it makes you question the world that we live in. You also develop a range of skills throughout the course, um, most notably your critical thinking skills, your ability to construct an argument, both verbally and in writing, and the ability to articulate your views by supporting them with evidence. So let's have a quick look at the course overview and what you'll be studying throughout the two years. So in year 12, there are three main topics that we cover. The first is families and households. Uh, here we look at changes to couple relationships. We also explore the nature of childhood. We look at different sociological theories of the family, such as functionalism, Marxism, feminism. We look at demography which is things like death rates and birth rates and how they have changed over time. We look at how the family itself as a unit has changed and the impact of government policy on family. We also look at the education system. So we look at different theories of education and question why is it that we actually educate young people? We also look at how different groups within society achieve differently. For example, how does your class, your gender or your ethnicity affect your chances of success in the education system? 
And we also look at educational policy and the impact that the government decisions can have on your education. The third main topic running through year 12 is research methods. So in order to understand the world we live in, sociologists need to go out and complete research about the topics that we're studying. So we need to learn what methods that they use and we need to evaluate them. So these are things such as interviews, questionnaires, observations, and secondary data that already exists. There's another kind of mini topic running through which relates to just one question, which is methods in context. And this uh, allows you to apply your knowledge of research methods to an issue in the education system. So you merge together two of the big topics there. So that's what we do in year 12. We also do an introduction to the course in the first three weeks of, from September onwards, where we get everyone up to speed with just an overview of what sociology is. In year 13, then, we add uh, the big topics of crime and deviance, beliefs in society and sociological theory to the course. Crime and deviance um, is a very interesting topic. We start with theories of crime. So these are different explanations of crime from different sociological perspectives. We also look at the social distribution of crime, um, why particular classes of people, why I've already mentioned gender, seems to be an issue when it comes to crime and also ethnicity. Other topics in the crime section are crime in the media and how far the media may cause people to commit crime, globalisation, green crime, human rights, state crime, um, how we control crime in our society, how we punish people who do commit crime and the victims of crime, which is a relatively recent topic. The other big topic in year 13 is beliefs in society. This topic used to be called religion, but it's changed now. It's not about um, the beliefs of religion, it's about how religion may operate in different societies. So we look at theories of religion and what different sociological perspectives think about the purpose of religion in our society. We also think about whether religion can cause social change and actually change the very structure of our societies. Given our current modern, postmodern world, we have to look at issues of secularization and whether religion is declining or whether there is just more choice when it comes to religion today. Further new topics are religion in the global context. So we look at different countries and their relationships with religion, social groups and religiosity, which is the relationship between gender, class and ethnicity and religion. We look at different religious organizations um, where we look at different sects and cults such as Scientology um, and the impact that they have on the societies in which they exist. And we also look at science and ideology. The third big theme running through year 13 is sociological theory. Um, this is looking at the big theories in sociological thought and develop, developing them in quite a bit of detail. So we look at functionalism, Marxism, feminism, action theories, modernity, postmodernity, and then wider themes such as the relationship between sociology and social policy value, freedom and objectivity. And we look at the big question of can and should and is sociology a science. So that's the general overview of the topics covered throughout the course. So with that in mind, let me talk to you a little bit about the exams. There are three papers in the sociology A level. They are all two hours each. And the topics are broken down, as you can see. So paper one, um, is education with theory and methods. Topic, topics in sociology is paper two. Um, we choose to teach you families and households and beliefs in society, but there are other topics on that paper as well. And the third paper is crime and deviance with theory and methods. As you can see, all of the papers are equally weighted. So it's six hours of exams in total. This is where I should mention that there is no coursework um, there is a lot of content to learn, including a huge number of key concepts and key names. But I would say I do encourage you to keep a glossary um, from the very first lesson. So you're on top of all of those key concepts and names. But I also need to mention there are lots of essay based questions. If you have a look at the structure of the questions for each paper here, 
you can see the ones that are in bold are some of the big essay questions. So there's a 30 marker and a 20 marker on paper one. There's two 20 markers on paper two. And again, there's a 30 marker and one 20 marker on paper three. There's some small mark questions as well. A couple of four and six markers and lots of 10 markers, as you can see. Um, which are not essay based, but you still have to write in a fair bit of detail. They require you to write two very detailed paragraphs. Um, we do a lot of work on exam technique throughout the course too. Okay, so let's move to your taster task, your taster lesson. And let's talk about um, an issue, an area that runs through most of the crime and deviance topic. And that is the use of official crime statistics. Official crime statistics then are put together by the Home Office, by a branch of the government. And they're good because they show us patterns and trends in relation to the amount and types of crime that are happening in our society. Why are they good? Well, they allow us to make comparisons between different years. So we could look, you know, between 1980 and 2020 and look and see whether the amount of violent crime is increasing or decreasing, for example. It allows us to also look at different social groups. For example, we could look at the relationship between um, violent crime and ethnicity or class and gender or age. It all also allows us to make comparisons between different areas throughout the country. So official crime statistics can be very useful for making comparisons and looking at different trends. Now, the first task that I'd like you to do is using the computer that you're on. You can pause me in a minute. Please, can you open up the following web page? So if you use your search engine, feel free to just type in www.police.uk. You can pause me now while you get that up. OK, once you've got that up, you should hopefully see a screen like this once you've moved down a bit and you can see uh, a little box there where you can enter your postcode or the address or a local area and find out what kind of crimes are happening in your local area. Um, and you're going to do that in a minute. So you're going to put in your postcode in a second um, and have a look at what crimes are happening in your area. Don't pause me. Yet. I'm just going to talk you through the task. Once you um, have put in the postcode for your area, you'll see this come up. So these are the particular crimes throughout the last month um, in your particular area. Um, obviously, they might be slightly different. So you can have a look at the top four. You can have a look at the last uh, year and see the changes in crime per month. And if you go to the little tabs at the top where it says overview, crime map, stop and search and statistics, have a little play uh, with some of those and have a look um, at the crimes that you can see in a bit more detail. So if you look at the crime map, you'll be able to zoom in to the particular areas where crime was taking place. And if you go to the statistics tab, um, you'll be able to look throughout the years as to what different crimes were taking place. So feel free to have a play with those um, for the next five to 10 minutes. Type in some different postcodes, some different areas, um, and note down any findings that, that are particularly interesting to you. Um, you might wanna note down what are the top reported crimes in your area, and then perhaps compare that with a different area. Maybe look at an inner city area um, maybe an area of London or Manchester, Birmingham, Liverpool, one of the big cities throughout the UK and see what the similarities and differences may be and write down your findings. OK, so if you can have a little play with that while you explore the different areas and then um, you can just pause the video while you do that. OK, so hopefully you've had a bit of a chance to look at those statistics. Based on that, I want you to think about the following question. Can we take these crime statistics at face value? What I mean is, do they give us a true picture of the number of crimes happening in our area, your area, whatever area it is that you looked at? Do they really tell us what's happening? Is that a realistic number of crimes that you found? If you're answering yes to that, tell me why. If you're answering no, then tell me why. Maybe write it down. 
Sociologists would argue we cannot take official crime statistics at face value. We cannot do it. And even though sociologists use official crime statistics to come up with their explanations of crime, they are very wary of official crime statistics. We're going to have a think about why. In order to understand why sociologists are wary of this, you have to understand the process in which crime statistics are formed. So for a crime to actually be included in the Home Office statistics, it must be detected, it must be reported, it must be recorded by the police, and the suspect must be convicted. Hopefully, by just thinking about that, you can see that this process means that there are many crimes committed that actually never find their way into the official statistics. In sociology, we visualise this as a kind of ladder of crime. Um, so if you have a look at the box on the right hand side of the screen, you can see how complicated this process is. So in order for something to make its way into the official crime statistics, the crime obviously has to be committed, has to be discovered. Whoever discovers it has to define it as criminal. It has to be reported, recorded by the police. The police then have to decide whether to take any action to gather evidence. They have to arrest a suspect. And the Crown Prosecution sometimes gets involved. They have to decide whether there's enough evidence to prosecute and the suspect has to be found guilty. So what's your task? As you can probably see, at each stage of the ladder, there are various reasons why crimes essentially fall off. They don't make it to the next stage of the process. So your task over the next 10 minutes is to consider the various reasons why some crimes do not make their way to the next stage of the collection process. Try to include some examples of specific crimes as you go to develop your ideas further. You may want to write down these different ideas, the different steps of the ladder, and then consider the reasons why crimes may not get to the next stage of the ladder. So for example, just to start you off, a crime um, is committed and then to get to the next stage of the ladder, it has to be discovered. But you might argue, or well, some crimes are never discovered, in which case those crimes never make it onto the first step of the ladder. Work through those different ideas now, write down what you think, try to add some specific examples as you go. You can pause now for 10 minutes while you complete that task. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to think about that now. Let's go through some further ideas and you can note these down if you want to as well. So, as we mentioned, to start on the criminal ladder, the crime has to be committed and then it has to be discovered. But obviously, the first issue which we've mentioned is it may not be discovered at all. Some crimes can happen and it's only years and years later that um, we realise that a crime has been committed. That would then affect the statistics because if we're not sure the date that the crime happened, it may appear in the statistics of the year it was discovered, which may distort the findings slightly. The next thing that has to happen is a crime has to be defined as criminal. However, the person who uncovers the crime may simply not define it as a criminal act. For example, if someone stole something off your washing line, um, would you consider that a crime, a joke? Um, that's up to you how you define it. And therefore, things may happen, maybe more serious than stealing something off a washing line. Um, you have to decide whether to take it any further and whether to report it to the police. Many people do not report crimes to the police for a whole variety of reasons, and hopefully you've um, noted some of these down now. Depending on the type of crime, people may be embarrassed to report particular crimes to the, to the police. They, almost, they also may be fearful of reprisal, um, that something bad might happen if they tell someone um, that a crime has taken place. 
They may think the crime is slightly too trivial. Um, they don't want to bother the police with what's happened to them. You can add some specific examples to each of those if you want to as well. Um, for example, if it was a very violent crime um, towards you and the person said, don't tell the police, you know, or something worse will happen to you, then obviously that violent crime, maybe a, a GBH, for example, may never be reported. If you do report it to the police, it then has to be recorded by the police. But just because it's been reported, um, it doesn't mean that the police actually officially record it. Again, the police may decide it's too trivial, etc. And therefore, it's up to the police to decide whether to take any action. There's a whole range of reasons why the police may not decide to take action. It could be impacted by things such as the, whether they have the resources to investigate the uh, crime, whether they have the time to do so, and the nature of the crime itself. For example, throughout Year 13, we look at the issue of antisocial behaviour. It's difficult in these circumstances for the police to know exactly what category antisocial behaviour falls under. Um, for example, someone shouting and swearing outside of your house. Um, is that counted as antisocial behaviour? Does it have to happen once, more than once? And all of those things can be down to the specific police force, the area, the nature of the location where it's happening. It's quite a complicated process. If the police do decide to take action, then they obviously have to gather evidence. But they may not have enough evidence to take the case further. In which case, again, these crimes fall off the ladder. So even though we've got all the way up until this stage, we know a crime's been committed, it's been discovered by someone, it's been reported to the police, they've recorded it, they've decided, okay, we'll go ahead and look into this. They may get to the point where there isn't enough evidence. Perhaps the witnesses that uh, someone may have given forward don't want to give evidence anymore. And therefore, the case has to be dropped. Again, all of those crimes fall off the ladder. If they do have enough evidence, then perhaps the police may go and arrest the suspect involved, or they may not find the suspect at all, in which case it cannot go any further. The CPS, which is the Crown Prosecution Service, may also be involved, and sometimes the police will bring forward a case and it will go to the Crown Prosecution Service and they will decide whether to prosecute or they might not decide to prosecute. At this stage, even though the police have done lots and lots of um, discovering of particular evidence, the Crown Prosecution Service can turn around and say um, that they can't take it any further, in which case, again, these crimes fall off the ladder. And lastly, the suspect has to be found guilty or not. Perhaps the suspect isn't found guilty if they go to Crown Court and it's trial before a jury. Maybe the jury finds the suspect innocent in which case a crime clearly has taken place, but maybe it was the wrong suspect, or maybe they were there wasn't enough evidence at that stage to convict them, in which case it doesn't make its way into the official crime statistics. So sometimes sociologists look at this issue of using official crime statistics, and they look at the idea of an iceberg, and this is a way to explain what we're seeing with official crime statistics. Just have a think for a moment about how an iceberg can be used to describe official crime statistics. OK, hopefully you've understood that the issue is we see a large amount of criminal activity um, that obviously happens. Um, but never appears in the criminal statistics. So the bit that we do see is the iceberg above the water. That's the bit that we do see. That's essentially what does appear in the statistics. And the huge um, piece of ice underneath the water reflects all the stuff that clearly happens, but we don't see. This is known as the dark figure of crime. There's a huge amount of crime that's happening that we never know about, we never hear about officially. As a result of this, then, the conclusion is, well, how accurate are official crime statistics? Well, they can be useful, like we said, for looking at overall trends and patterns, but sociologists would say they lack validity. They do not show us a true picture of how much crime is taking place 
And therefore, next time you're watching the news and you hear them talking about gun crime increasing or knife crime or violent crime or sexual crime, you need to question that and think about how much crime is actually happening. As a result, sociologists believe we cannot take official crime statistics at face value. And instead, we must accept that they are socially constructed. That's a key concept that we learn throughout the course. They've been created by a process of social interactions. And depending on the different interactions that happen at each stage of that ladder means whether they'll appear in the final crime statistics. For example, there can be various reasons why the police may operate in particular ways, which mean that those crimes never get investigated in the first place. Or, we, as we'll look at throughout the course, maybe the police are biased in a particular way towards particular classes, ethnicities, ages, genders, and all of those things can affect the statistics that we see. Okay. That was just a little taster of uh, sociology at A-level at Hearts and Essex. Thank you for listening and hopefully I'll see you in September.